Hello, I'm Frank Rivera. I was born in 1939 uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up in a nearby little town on Lake Erie called Ashtabula. I first started painting, and draw I should say I first started drawing, I never saw paint until later on, uh, say around age four. Mostly it was dr drawing for my father who was living abroad in Hawaii. He was a seaman second class in the U.S. Navy and there was a world war going on. So I couldn't read or write, but I could draw and I could make postcards. Later on, uh, when I did learn to read and write and I did go to uh, elementary school, I was particularly impressed with the figure three and those two wonderful arcs and fully committed a figure eight where they looped through three and eight. So when I had a sum dad, I just put, kept putting down threes and eights and my teacher was astounded. When I was in high school, I had already started painting practically on a daily basis, certainly drawing on a daily basis. So with my mother's help, we applied to the Columbus Art School where I received a full tuition scholarship. Two years at the Columbus Art School and then I transferred to Cleveland Institute of Art. I finally went to Yale, um, and that would be 1961. After Yale, I went off as a boy professor to Michigan State University. Many important artists came as artists in residence and as guest lecturers, including Clement Greenberg, the critic. I had the uh, privilege of driving Greenberg around for a week and we became somewhat acquainted. He was giving an important uh, large group lecture called The Urban Nature of Art. He was already somewhat dissatisfied with teaching and itching to paint more hours than I was able to do as a professor. Greenberg recounted historically how art always seemed to be generated from the city first. He recounted developments in Venice, particularly in Florence, and in Paris, and of course in New York. So I asked him one night as I was letting him off to his uh, little rented apartment in East Lansing, I said, I'm thinking of um, breaking with teaching and becoming a full-time painter, and I know I should go to a city. Do you think I should go to Paris or New York? He said, Frank, let me think about that. I'll let you know in the morning. Morning came and he said, Paris, it still works. I packed my bags, bankrupt my small savings account, took a flight, thought I had enough money for a full year. I was able to rent a studio, didn't speak any French, didn't eat too well for the uh, first two weeks. So the money started to run out and it didn't look like a 12 month stay in Paris was on the horizon. I, really had just enough money after three months to get the airfare back to New York. Oh, when I arrived in New York, I really didn't have much money in my pocket. I had to go stay with my cousin Joe Bono, who lived at home with his mom in the Bronx, until I could find a job. Well, actually, it wasn't that difficult because I ran into a, an old friend who said they were hiring at the Museum of Modern Art. By the next week, I had a job. MoMA is a wonderful institution and you'll get the best art education possible just by walking through MoMA, even as a visitor. But as a guard, it was fabulous. I had indicated to our supervisor that I love Matisse. So he said, Rivera, how would you like Matisse this morning? I said, oh, great. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Here's how it worked. I went up to the gallery and MoMA had... Uh, you know, a few hundred members, I suppose, maybe a thousand members. But none of them would walk in until about 15 minutes after the door opened. So, bottom line, consequence here, I am alone with Matisse in this gallery for 15 or 20 minutes. It's like communing with an angel. And it seemed like a pretty good salary it wasn't so much the money, it was the absolute incredible experience of working at MoMA. 
But I was able, with that money, to rent a room and to rent a studio, my first loft. I had a $45 top floor studio in pre-Soho. That would have been around 1964. My experience at MoMA, it caused me to, to know 20th century uh, European painting, American painting really well. Two painters uh, stuck in my mind. Uh, Max Ernst, the surrealist painter and collagist, who was a painter who I loved for his storytelling ability and his uh, ability to put opposites together, non sequiturs. Mostly he was a narrative painter, a figurative painter. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, for more formal concerns for color, mostly for line, I love Piet Mondrian, the Dutch painter, particularly his early paintings where he uh, abstracts a tree and his use of line and line breaks off into multiples from large branches to limbs to twigs. So somehow there was a fusion between those two important influences. My goal was to be recognized, of course, and I started painting like a few artists that, that were recognized in a, a, a technique or a style, stylistically speaking, a stripes, a horizontal lines. Some painted vertical lines, some painted horizontal lines. I became a stripe painter. Frankly, a, a boring look of painting because everybody was doing it. However, it did briefly bring me recognition because it was the flavor of the time, mid-70s. And I uh, had my second uh, loft studio in New York, and Marsha Tucker, curator at the Whitney Museum, walked in and selected one of my striped paintings for the Whitney Biennial of 1975. I was thrilled. And of course, the galleries were showing striped paintings too. Susan Caldwell came to the same studio that was on uh, Leonard Street, Lower Manhattan, and selected three paintings for a group show. And I was showing with uh, Bryce Martin, who had already had significant reputation. So my goals were recognition, and that was pretty much the extent of it. Uh, partly because I, frankly, was fed up with looking, being a painter, looking like every other painter. And I had a, what I would call a crisis, and I gave up painting, particularly large painting. In those days, the larger the painting, the more likely it was you were going to have a show because galleries were getting bigger and bigger. And I decided to paint small. When you're standing in front of a big painting, there's something that struck me at the time. And you're listening to a lecturer. Let's say you're looking at a, a mural-sized Pollock, and you've got 10 or 15 people around. It's not very intimate. You're all looking at the same painting. You can discuss it even while listening to your lecturer. But if you paint small, it's like a one-on-one -on -one experience where you have to put your nose up to the painting, and it's much more intimate. I didn't exactly arrive at small panel painting straight away. I had to do a transition. So my transition came by building a little, call it a little miniature stage set. Now what I liked about it was that I would enclose it in a box so it could be seen only through one eye. It's like monolithic vision. A little um, box with a slight magnifying single lens. Looking at something three-dimensional with one eye flattens it out. It makes it look more like a painting. Also, more importantly, only one person can look at that setup at a time. So if you were to, you were with a partner and you looked at the art, then the partner would take his or her turn to look at the art. You'd have to discuss the memory of what you saw rather than the actual moment of looking together. I define myself as a painter, finally, after 1975, as f finding my own voice. In other words, I'm not trying to be somebody else. So I, I do only what I want to do, and it, it's got to resonate with my unconscious, as well as my conscious mind. Now I work a, a relatively small scale that seems to have stuck. And the largest scale work I would do in, in current 
painting would be maybe three by four feet. That would be large scale. As for what happens in the painting, I've been influenced by a number of things. Well, of course, Max Ernst. My painting continues to be narrative, but it's not straight storytelling with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's more um, free-rolling chronology, uh, comparing objects to objects, for example. The eye loves to sort out the differences between polar opposites. For example, if you have uh, the three points of a triangle versus a near triangle, the four points of a square, the eye tries to see the, the difference and make up the compromise. That, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is connections that are inharmonious, that are unexpected, as you might have in a, in a dream, where something happens and is lost and is rediscovered. Kind of like lots of things are happening, but where is Waldo? Something is missing. So it's figurative and narrative in that way, but they're not always narrative with people, individuals. Frequently, they are narrative with objects. And then there are certain themes in my painting uh, that reoccur, such as hands. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, hands as the um, the animator of things, of objects. One example is uh, if you order something from, let's say, Amazon that you have to assemble, you often open the box and you say, uh, read instructions before assembly. Now, fortunately, there's a little uh, storyboard there that shows hands putting parts together. And that idea of hands manipulating parts is a frequently recurring icon within my paintings. If I had to define myself as a painter, I would say it starts as a very personal statement, such as is meant only for myself. Paintings by Frank for Frank, just like a diary is meant for the writer of a diary. Not necessarily to be shared, often with its antecedents in not so much in the daily world, which we the painters all experience by observation, but in the nocturnal world, which you, we are gifted with dreams. And I've always been a lucid dreamer. And that becomes part of the tapestry of what it is I want to say. And I wouldn't call myself a surrealist, or one with surrealist appreciation. I wouldn't call myself a Bradella painter, but I would call myself a very personal painter. One who has to make the painting communicate. So there are pieces of the painting that have to be reassembled by the viewer, just as you might reassemble your dream by thinking it over when you wake from a dream. Making those parts relevant to your experience. On the other hand, they must be perfectly crafted, so well made. I often, as I said earlier, I spend sometimes months, if not years, on a single painting. And my goal is to create a painting that's worthy of a wall in a museum, not so much in a gallery, but that will stand the test of time. And finally, one that would always engage the viewer in a dialogue, which goes something like, what is Frank really trying to say here to me? And how did I get a look at his diary or his journal?
We're talking together here in my Heightstown studio, which is on the uh, third floor of our, our old 1895 house uh, here on Broad Street. This Heightstown studio is a, a meditative place, and it's a it's a workplace. So I also have a, a second studio, uh, really quite important to me, um, in the gallery district uh, known as Chelsea, downtown Manhattan, where it's set up as a gallery itself. Uh, track lighting, uh, white walls, work on the walls. And I participate in a thrice annual event, three times a year, of open studio. Sometimes I'll, I'll get fair number of visitors and sometimes there won't be a lot. However, um, it's the people who come in. Potentially, everybody who walks through those doors is eligible to buy something. But more importantly to me, they're looking at my paintings in a serious way and if I can read that they are getting it, so to speak, I am totally satisfied. I just like the uh, the kind of offhand nature of the public walking in a, into a studio, um, maybe just out of curiosity. I follow uh, one person shows, group shows. Uh, the galleries change shows every three weeks. I try to keep up to speed on that. I have membership cards to MoMA, the Whitney Museum, uh, the Metropolitan Museum, and I'm up to speed on what's the latest and the greatest. Uh, but it doesn't influence me in a significant way. It only helps me to see the big picture. <laughs>